Oil prices coming off their recent highs as tension in the Middle East have eased slightly around Israel, withdrew more forces from southern Gaza. But geopolitical risks for the energy sector still remain, and oil prices are elevated over the last three months, up by about 22 percent. Joining us right now to talk about it is Dan Jurgen. He is S&P Global Vice Chair and the author of The New Map, Energy, Climate, and the Clash of Nations. Um, what happened? I know this is partially supply, partially demand, but we are looking at a big increase in oil prices to the point where people are sitting up and paying attention. Yeah, it's a tighter market, and that's the fundamentals. On top of that is the geopolitical risk. As you say, there's an easing today because of the Israeli troops, but what's hanging over and what gave it that extra boost was after the Israeli attack on the consulate in uh, Syria that killed the uh, Iranian uh, Revolutionary Guards. The Iran has said that they're going to uh, revenge uh, 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 Hezbollah says it's inevitable, and so the question is, is there going to be a more direct war between Israel and Iran? With oil prices at these levels, we're already hearing from places like airlines where, you know, that, that's going to start eating into profits. What, what level do you kind of look at oil prices and say, okay, this is a game changer for the markets? Well, I think it is in the, in the low 90s. And if there is an expectation of higher prices, it's also a problem for inflation in general. And it's a real problem if you're an incumbent running for re-election. Excellent points. Um, not much that can be done at this point, or is there? It not much. Like I mean, they've used the st Strategic Petroleum Reserve. You know, apparently, from what we re read, the administration has asked the Ukrainians not to continue to attack Russian oil refineries. They don't want to see disruptions in the market. But there do seem to be limited tools, and uh, there's only so much that a president can do. So the administration's aware. The administration the is very aware. Uh, Dan, let's talk about Sarah Week and some of the things that came out, because I had never seen um, one of the issues that you guys kind of got to the bottom of, this idea that electricity demand in the United States is rising far more rapidly than we can possibly keep yeah. up with it. Until two years ago, it was utilities thought they were dealing with flat demand, declining demand, and suddenly it's turned around. And uh, one example is that uh, if you go back a year and a half ago, in the earnings calls of electric utilities, we noticed there were like three mentions of data centers. Most recently, there were 120 mentions. Wow. And it is the data centers on top of the electrification, on top of EVs, but the data centers and, and, uh, and AI, this is the driver. And everywhere, even in Northeast now, they said that the forecast from two years ago is now been doubled for what the growth is, and that's a challenge of how do you build and what do you build. I mean, it takes years and years and years and years to build out additional um, production and additional output for electricity. Are we prepared for this? No, I don't think so. Uh, and there's uh, permitting issues, whether you're doing transmission lines, whether you're doing new plants. One thing this has given a boost to are the small nuclear reactors. At Sierra Week this year, it was like they're going to happen. That was the, the difference Where? there. Uh, they could be next to a data center. Data centers are what use the vast amount of, um, of uh, electricity. How and quickly could those be spun up, though? What? I mean, both from a regulatory perspective and a physical, yeah, like, how quickly can you build them? Well, at this point, uh, the nearest ones that I know about are, like, 2030 that they think they can do it. So there is absolutely that, that, that problem. And but that's the, the 2030 to get regulatory approval or to, locally no, to get or, the first, or federally? Dow, that's the other thing. Is Dow, it, Dow says they'll have one in operation in 2030. And uh, one of the other things I noticed at Sear Week this year is the optimism around nuclear that we, we hadn't seen before. Is, is there still a not in my backyard issue with it where oh, it sounds like a great idea, build it somewhere else? Well, there will be that question, and, and it, it goes back to what Andrew said. It clearly will be the permitting issues, because the other theme that ran through the conference is in terms of getting anything done in the United States. Permitting is a really big problem. Dan, last week we talked a little bit about EVs and the battle between EVs and hybrids. Um, hybrids have been pretty fantastic, because I think the difference is you have all the benefits of better fuel mileage, all of these things that are great for the economy, but the customer doesn't really Well, I heard this. you last week at, at talk about your personal experience of hybrids. And which I love is it. The hybrid's compelling. great. I yeah. don't have to do anything differently. Yeah, it does it. But it's very different. If you look at China, 35 percent of new cars are EVs. Mm -hmm. Europe, 24 percent. Although in Germany, you take away the subsidies, sales go down. U.S., it's about 10 percent. And, you know, you had those 4,000 dealers who wrote to the White House saying, put the brakes on EVs, right. and they've become, what's happened is they've become politicized. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, 
EVs are going to be part of the 2024 presidential campaign. Let me campaign. ask you a hybrid question, though. And actually, it's, it's interesting. Henry Blodgett had been on Twitter uh, a week or two ago asking a similar question, which was, mm -hmm. why are there not more hybrids? Yeah, and, and why, why not sort of re reverse the, the scheme so that there's like a little bit of, of hybrid at the end, you know, make basically an electric car with, with a tiny amount of hybrid rather than a uh, gas powered engine with like a little bit of battery. And it seems that most of the, the folks that are in this industry feel like it's a simplicity thing, which is to say either you're all electric and if you want to add some distance, add an extra piece of battery or be in the combustion engine business, but to do both is more expensive, more complicated, et cetera. Is that true? Well, it is true. Uh, a, a hybrid is a more complicated car because there's two engine systems. And a couple of years ago, the embrace of EVs by the major automobile companies, they said they're simpler to build, but they've run into the consumer resistance uh, over them. And that the system, we don't, we don't really have the charging system. Uh, and we don't have people, we're a consumer society, people were not ready uh, to go to that me, way. it's the Amazon principle, give the customer what they want. Right. And the it's one company that stood out was Toyota, which said, you know, kept saying hybrids and everybody else was over there. Toyota and now they're done well out of it.